Here's your smart fact of the day. Imagine if you're able to borrow a human being like you can a book. The human library actually allows us to do that. Started in Denmark in the year 2000, this human library allows us to borrow a human being in order to learn from that human being. The human being then teaches you to go beyond the stereotype. It might be a stereotype of an alcoholic or a bipolar person or, you know, take your pick. In today's episode of Smarter With Said, what we are going to try and do is figure out if we can get inspired by the human library project and actually try and figure out whether something like this can be useful in both companies as well as educational institutions. Let's go. Now, first things first, while I think this is a wonderful idea, I am not certainly asking anyone to steal and replicate this idea and undermine all the good work that the human library is doing. I think they've got a good thing going. They are uh, doing something unique to the world and uh, more power to them. I think that it is something that is, uh, you know, organized as corporate events. And I think it probably falls into a non-profit uh, sort of organization, the human library. And it also allows uh, them to perhaps act as, you know, a CSR activity for, for companies. So while that is great, this idea or this thought that I've got is actually just inspired from them rather than Uh, something which, uh, you know, kind of tries to replicate them or imitate them because that is just not right. They're already doing a fantastic job. In fact, if you go and visit their website, uh, you'll soon understand, you know, the depth and the beauty of the human library and how they are actually looking at people as books. So for context, first of all, let's try to understand this uh, people as books thing, right? I mean, you can read a person like a book is what they say or You can also feel that, you know, sometimes you say you should not judge a book by its cover. Weirdly, that's what we do in this era of social media. Rapid judgments is what we fall prey to, right? So we are always making snap judgments. We are uh, judging a person by the cover, rather a book by the cover. And we are also, you know, kind of not really taking time to understand people who are not like us. So if somebody has suffered from some specific illness or is suffering from some mental problems or is actually having uh, challenges that we cannot understand or recognize, we tend to avoid that. And that is where the human library comes into play. Now, I'm saying, well, that is all good. Is there something that we can get inspired by, right? And that was the context for this. In fact, the context was also a little bit... uh, you know, kind of spiced up by the fact that it is time when uh, educational institutes start their academic calendar. And it's an exciting time for students and for, you know, even teachers uh, who see the young batch of new students come in, whether it's at a postgraduate level or, at you know, um, undergraduate level. Uh, it's an exciting time. People are, you know, kind of curious about you know, who who's going to be their classmate, who who the new people are who the juniors are, who the seniors are, etc. And it is something which is fraught with a little bit of being overwhelmed. And this is the sort of situation that can unfortunately lead to maybe some sort of ragging or or some sort of uh, illegal, uh, you know, uh, putting pressure on people just because you're senior and and the rest of it. I don't want to get too deeply involved in this. I think a lot of educational institutes have very serious sort of Um, ways in which they deal with this. But my feeling is that imagine instead of, uh, you know, the usual sort of enculturation activities that happen, uh, if you could actually borrow a person like you can borrow a book in that sort of scenario, and you can actually learn from people who are not like you. So imagine that everybody's name goes in and you are matched up by somebody who's you know, the the furthest away from you, or maybe you can have a selection of people who are not like you. Because what tends to happen is that when you go to a new place, and this happens specifically in a residential campus, when you're far away from the city that you're in or the town that you're in, that you tend to congregate with people who speak your language, with people who are like you, with people who can make you feel comfortable in an uncomfortable uh, place. And while that is important, and that should also be encouraged, we should also be looking towards opening up people's minds, you know, people 
people's brains into connecting and meeting up with people that they would have never met otherwise. And in fact, Micah, one of the places that is so dear to me uh, and where I teach, uh, does this beautifully. There are so many people who come in from very rigid conservative backgrounds who get to meet their exact opposites, you know, liberal, progressive people. And there's an exchange of views, perspectives, and even ideologies that, that happens on, on the campus, which is so beautiful to watch. Now, that is a sort of a quasi-human library sort of situation without actually us understanding it, but it is organic by nature. Now, imagine if an event was created which kind of makes it inorganic, and instead of the typical speed dating, enculturation thing, which perhaps might be fun, uh, you know, considering, you know, th that it is so popular, you could have something like this as well. And it, it would go a long, long way in which you can build your outlook. And I think specifically this would work even better at an undergraduate residential campus level because it is something that, you know, your, your mind is even more neuroplastic uh, the younger you are. Now, all said and done, this is for educational institutes, but can we actually do this in corporations? Now, this is where it would be weird because people go there to work. People don't want to waste time. People are different. People don't know how long they're going to be in an organization and stuff like that. But imagine a situation wherein you can learn from somebody who is from a completely different department and not just learn about that person, but also about the kind of function he or she does, but in a non-threatening way. I'm sure the HR of many companies is already doing this sort of buddy system, and but that happens in the orientation program thing. Check out the uh, you know the episode on orientation uh, that that I've done recently. Uh, but for this, I would say it is it is goes beyond. It goes beyond the orientation program, and it is uh, focusing more on let's say meet a new human being once every month or twice a month or whatever it may be, wherein you're trying to learn not just from the person, but also you're trying to learn a new skill. Now, that skill might be something to do with office work or something that, you know, learn how to make pizza or something. And it is such a, an enriching experience to learn something from a complete stranger. You know, you would have never known this guy from finance if you're in marketing or somebody from purchase or somebody from engineering. And uh, it, it's a good way to actually try to understand how people are. Now, while people might take it as a painful additional sort of thing that they will have to do beyond their work hours, it could be done as a voluntary thing. It could be done as a lunchtime thing. It could be perhaps done as something which counts towards certain areas of their, you know, uh, diversity uh, and, and inclusion, inclusivity uh, sort of um, commitments. So you can have different ways in which you can look at an initiative like this. But I believe that if this sort of thing happens, the, the strength of the tribe will only increase and in, it will increase in an organic and real way rather than the rara way that you can actually see in uh, you know, be t being talked about in meeting rooms and boardrooms and every other kind of room. So that's it. I mean, this is my spin-off on, on the Human Library Project and the way in which it can be adapted. Um, not the Human Library Project, but just the, the, the sort of interaction can be that can be adapted in educational institutes as well as, you know, uh, organizations. I'm sure a lot of institutions and organizations are doing something around this as well. But for any anybody who's not doing it, just a thought, just a thought. And by the way, if you like, you know, this, maybe you should set up a human library project in your city, I guess. I don't know why I'm being that spokesperson, but I just love this idea of talking to strangers, I suppose, uh, and strangers who can teach you a few things rather than not teach you a few things, right? I hope you like this episode of mine, a little different from the rest. And uh, if you like this episode, do like and subscribe to my podcast. Many more to come from from where this one came from. Like podcasts like these? Well, then you should go to IVM Podcast and check even more wonderful and more varied stuff coming your way. And hey, if you like me, I'm The Traveling Professor. And you can always follow me on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Until next time then. Until next time. Bye.